For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, here to say, like whenever, man. Or rather, to argue with it. Because in our latest Wednesday Wake Up newsletter, on which this readout is based, we raise a very important question about man-made climate change, namely, when exactly is it supposed to have really kicked in? You might think the answer is obvious. The typical alarmist argument seems to be that around 2000 we had a surge in hot years, hurricanes, wildfires, sea level rise, jellyfish, Zika, allergies, and all that stuff. Isn't that what they say? Well, yes and no. In fact, you get a surprising range of answers from 2019 to 1983 or 1970, 1920, 1850. Do I hear 5000 BC? Yes, I do. But as the great philosopher of science Karl Popper wrote, quote, insofar as a scientific statement speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. And insofar as it is not falsifiable, it does not speak about reality, end quote. So how can we test whether man-made climate change produced significant differences in, you know, climate, if we have no idea what the evidence is meant to be? As we've pointed out, if the evidence is an increase in wildfires in the last two decades, it didn't even happen nor have hurricanes become more frequent or stronger. But remember that James Hansen's pivotal 1988 U.S. Senate testimony said that the effects of climate change were already underway then. So presumably wildfires and hurricanes should have been getting worse since the 1980s, if in fact climate change makes them worse. And here I want to bring up one of those odd rectangular things that people used to look at before we got the new rectangular things we can't look away from. I'm talking about books. And specifically, Brian Fagan's intriguing The Little Ice Age, How Climate Made History, 1300 to 1850. Because in that book, he blames farmers and settlers clearing land from the mid 19th century on for releasing, quote, vast quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, triggering for the first time humanly caused global warming, end quote. Now, if true, it might explain why the glaciers started retreating well before the 20th century something that Michael Manns and Greta Thunberg's of this world struggle with, or would struggle with if they deigned to mention it. On the other hand, Fagan's claim makes it hard to understand why we didn't see the climate apocalypse decades ago. Unless, of course, the impact of CO2 tails off rapidly as it accumulates, in which case there is no crisis now and none is coming. Or alternatively, maybe the crisis arrived and we missed it. In his book, which was published in 2000, Fagan speaks of, quote, record-breaking summer heat, end quote, in the 1990s. Yes, the decade of which alarmists now say, ah, those were the days. Or maybe they don't, because essentially they seem to shift the markers as needed. They'll call things in the 1980s proof of global warming, they'll call things in the 2000s proof of global warming, things in the 1950s, whatever. But as Popper warned, a theory that explains everything explains nothing. And then there's Dan Britt's 2012 video claiming that the Holocene would already have yielded to another ice age were it not for massive amounts of CO2 released by the spread of agriculture in, yes, 5000 BC. Fending off the next ice age makes you think maybe there's something to be said for global warming after all. But it still leaves the problem of saying when it was. Indeed, Fagan alone is all over the map. At one point, he says we now live in, quote, an era so warm that 65 British bird species laid their eggs an average of 8.8 .8 days earlier in 1995 than in 1971, end quote. And, quote, brush fires consumed over 500,000 hectares of drought-plagued Mexican forest in 1998, end quote. And, quote, the sea level has risen in Fiji an average of 1.5 centimeters a year over the past nine decades, end quote. So, did the effects hit in the 1990s, the 1970s, or 1910. Please tell us. Tell us roughly where to look for the dividing line between natural processes dominating and human ones dominating. Because we can't begin to test your hypothesis about CO2 against the evidence unless you tell us roughly what evidence it's meant to explain. Oh, one more thing. Fagan's book is well worth reading despite the criticisms above, and not least because it too underlines that cooling is actually bad for people. Also, because he insists that the Little Ice Age was difficult for human beings, not only because it was cold, but also because, wait for it, the cold brought extreme weather after the comparative stability of the medieval warm period. So, while we're at it, can we also please be told whether you think that warming increases or decreases extreme weather? Because otherwise, you're just making it up as you go along, and that's not science. <laughs>
There's lots more in the newsletter, of course, including the recent panic because a piece of ice fell off Greenland that's very big compared to Manhattan, but very small compared to, say, the Greenland ice sheet. Mind you, glaciers and icebergs calve from growing ice sheets, not shrinking ones. But never mind. The point is, we're all going to die if, that is, our sightseeing boat gets too close to the edge of an expanding glacier and a chunk of ice lands on our heads. We also comment on the odd tendency of so-called climate groups to march with a hammer and sickle, call for disarmament, and generally try to live up to that old jibe about them being watermelons. You know, green on the outside, red on the inside. Including a company sowing rude political messages about climate into clothing. As with Greta Thunberg herself, if reputable alarmists don't distance themselves from this kind of behavior and from these kinds of people, when they jump the shark, you do too. Of course, sometimes the alarmists just jump the shark independently, as with Gavin Schmidt recently declaring that, quote, most climate deniers are sociopaths, end quote. And a Merry Christmas to you too, sir. Unfortunately, this drift into mindless polemics seems now to include Scientific American, which just gave the first political endorsement ever in its 175-year history to, again, wait for it, Joe Biden, because Donald Trump, quote, rejects evidence and science, end quote. And also because he rejects socialized medicine and higher pay for childcare workers, both of which now are apparently settled science, not political positions. But then when Biden says something goofy about science, along the lines of, say, quote, deadly signs like these Western American wildfires are unmistakable climate change, poses an imminent existential threat to our way of life, end quote, the editors of Venerable Scientific American stroke their long gray beards and remain quietly above the fray. In the newsletter, we also talk about somebody who says the plan to use nuclear power to get hydrogen out of water to give us portable, zero-carbon energy is no good because hydrogen might also destroy the climate. And hey, you know, the precautionary principle. If you're not sure, don't do it. Obviously, it would have prevented the invention of fire, to say nothing of writing, beer, animal husbandry, and possibly even water. I mean, that stuff could drown you, sharks in it, it's just, let's not. Yet apparently the precautionary principle doesn't stand in the way of shutting down the only reliable, affordable energy source we have. The newsletter also draws on our collaboration with CO2Science.org to talk about a history of wildfires in Mediterranean Europe. They're not getting worse. And the problem of man-made temperature readings rather than temperature increases, in this case in the form of some very real urban heat island effects in China. If it's in the middle of a city surrounded by asphalt, it shows warming. If it's out in a rural area, not so much. As always, if you like what you see, forward our newsletters and videos to friends and colleagues, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, send comments and ideas to our blog, and support us to help us keep providing content. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. Thank you.